So this short lecture is about how the extended Euclidean algorithm works. Um, let me briefly review what the Euclidean algorithm is doing. So this is something I expect you have seen earlier. So it's an algorithm to compute the GCD, so the greatest common divisor of two numbers. Let's take M and N who come in. And then we're trying to figure out what is the largest number that divides both of them. If you've seen this in school, then the typical way of dealing with it is that you compute the prime factorization of m and n, and then figure out what is the largest of each prime, each largest prime power which divides it. So for instance, if m is 2 times 5 times 7, and n is 3 times 7 squared, then they both overlap at the 7 and only to the power of 1. So the GCD would be 7. Now, the Euclidean algorithm is doing this computation of 7, figuring out what is the largest number that is dividing both integers, it's doing it much faster. It computes it in time polynomial in the length of the integers. So the length of an integer is just the log base 2, so how long does it take to write it down? And um, here's a short summary of what this algorithm is doing. In each step it takes the larger of the number and sees how often the smaller of the number fits in there. So if this is my m and this is my n, then I'm looking how often can I fit this thing into the n. Now in this case it fits twice and leaves some remainder. So the quotient q1 is 2 here and the remainder r1 is this integer. And then we're changing roles. The n, which was the smaller of the numbers, now takes the role of the larger number and we're seeing how often this remainder, this r1, fits in here. Well, okay, fits once, so q2 is 1, and then there's a small remainder r2. And then we continue the same way. So always taking the remainder as the new smaller number and the former smaller number as the bigger number. Now we're dealing with integers, we're actually dealing with positive integers here. So eventually when we're getting for smaller and smaller integers, well each remainder is smaller than the number by which we divide. So eventually we're hitting zero. So the algorithm will stop. And then the GCD is the last non-zero remainder. So if we're getting zero as ri, then ri minus one is a GCD. The extended Euclidean algorithm does compute a little bit more. It also outputs two other integers a and b so that the following linear equation is holding. So this GCD d is equal to am plus bn. And we're getting a bound on those two numbers so now one of these two is typically uh, negative, so we're talking about the absolute values of those, and the coefficient one of the m, the a, is smaller in absolute value than the n, and the coefficient one of the n is smaller in absolute value than the m. To get these uh, integers a and b, um, one way, and that's probably the way you've seen it first, is to just backtrack your computation. So starting with the GCD, this ri minus 1, um, you're swapping sides. So ri minus 1 was the remainder of taking ri minus 3 and dividing out by ri minus 2. Okay, so that means that ri minus 1 is equal to ri minus 3 minus the previous quotient, so that's qi minus 1 times the ri minus 2. And then I'm saying, well, we're doing this recursively, so the next thing we're replacing is the ri minus 2, so that's the next smallest remainder. We're replacing this by the corresponding expression, so then we're getting ri minus 4 minus qi minus 2 minus uh, times ri minus 3, and that all multiplies by qi minus 3. All right, so the next step would be to sort. So we're having now the ri minus 4, we're having this qi minus 1 times, and the ri minus 3, we're having one times from the beginning, and then minus qi minus 1 times minus qi minus 2. So that we're getting larger and larger numbers. Well, that's not the most efficient way of computing this. It is much faster if you compute this a and b, or the partial representations uh, for a and b, as you go along. So the extended Euclidean algorithm, I've written here a very compact way where we're operating on vectors of length 3, and I'm also restricting my inputs to positive integers, so well, natural numbers that could be zero, not that it would be particularly interesting. Um, and so the output of this algorithm is the greatest common divisor d, 
and the representation, these two integers a and b, so that we're getting this linear equation of the GCD as a am plus bn. Now we initialize this whole thing, we take the first vector being the first integer 1, 0, and the second vector, the second integer 0, 1. All right, then at each step we'll be doing an operation and I'll need an extra variable, I need an extra vector to hold some intermediate result. So that's what you're seeing there in step 3.1, um, that we're putting something on hold in x and then, well, the old w becomes a new v. So that's similar to the operation except that we had before, where we're swapping the previously smaller number for the larger number except for now we're doing this on a vector of length 3. Let me show you on the side an example so it's easy to see what's going on. So if you want to compute the extended Euclidean algorithm on integers 312 and 213, so this is how we initialize it, so this is steps 1 and 2. And then what 3.1 is doing, well it takes the first entry of the top vector and divides out the second vector. So that one gives us the quotient. Well, in this case, the larger, uh, the smaller fits only once into this larger integer, so our first quotient is 1. So this thing in parentheses there, so the v of 0 divided by w of 0, that is just the quotient of the first two numbers. And then we use this quotient to scale normally just the first entry, we're taking quotient times the smaller number away from the bigger number. And now we're doing this on all three positions in the vector. Now in this case, the quotient is 1, so we're subtracting 213 from 12 and getting 99. And we're also subtracting 0 from 1 and 1 from 0. So we're getting the vector 99, 1, minus 1. All right. And then we call this new vector x. We call the old w, put on the new v, and then we put the x into w. That just means we're now looking at the next two rows. All right, so now we're looking at how much this 99 row fits into the 212 row. Well, 200 is a little bit larger than 2 times this, so we're having the quotient of 2. And so we're now subtracting 2 times this 99 row from the 212 row, 13. From the 213 row. So we're taking the front is just left over 15 and then 0 minus 2 times 1 and 1 minus minus 2 times 1. So that's minus 2 and 3. And then we again swapping rows, skipping that part now, and we're looking how often does 15 fit into 99. That is 6 times, so our next quotient is 6, and we're computing 6 times the bottom vector and subtracting it from the top. 6 times 15 is 90, so we're getting a 9 in the front, and then 1 minus minus 6 times 2, so that's 13, and the other one has a minus 1, and we're taking minus 3 times 6, so that gives minus 19. All right, next quotient is easy. Again, quotient is 1, so we're just subtracting this last vector from the previous one, so we're getting 6 minus 15 and 22, 6 fits 1 into 9. You also see that if I would be allowing negative quotients, then, I would, sorry, negative remainders, I could have saved the step here and jumped directly to minus 3. Let's stick with one algorithm. This one is easy to implement, so we're having maybe more steps than we need, but we still have that the number of steps is bounded by the large Fibonacci number that fits into the largest number. Um, that's a nice uh, way of thinking of it, you're always taking the small number away from the bigger one, and so the worst case is if the numbers are such that each number is exactly having quotient 1. And that means that each time you're fitting 1s in there, and then the remainder again fits 1s in the previous one, and that's how the Fibonacci numbers are defined. So having 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, plus previous one is 3, and 2 plus 3 is 5, and then 3 plus 5 is 8, and 5 plus 8 is 13. And so if you're looking at like what is the largest Fibonacci number that fits in there, 
that index is the maximum number of steps you're going to see. And here we're doing pretty badly in that most quotients are one, but we also had a big jump with the quotient of six. Anyway, we're almost there. So six fits once into nine, leaving the remainder three. We can fill up the whole thing. And now we're going to have an exact division because three fits into six with quotient two and remainder zero. Now at this point, we have reached the condition at while. So when the w, the first entry of w is zero, we stop the while loop. And then the previous vector has the GCD. So the GCD here is three. And then the next two coefficients are the a and the b. So those are being output by the algorithm. And then we can check this. So indeed, if you're taking 28 times 312, and subtracting 41 times 213, you're going to get 3. One thing to see why this algorithm is working is that at each step you have that the, well, I'm just writing it for V, but the same is true for W. At each step you have that the first entry is equal to the next entry times N plus the last entry times N. Very obviously for the first row, 312 is 1 times 312, but also for the second row, 213 is 0 times 312 plus 1 times 213. And since the first two rows satisfy this, it is also satisfied by any subsequent row because all we're doing is, well, adding multiples of one row to the other. So they will always keep having this relation with one another. And then at the end, when the first position is the GCD, then we're getting these two coefficients from the extended definition algorithm back. The reason that this algorithm matters is that it's a very common algorithm if you want to compute modular inversions. So let's take a look again at what this equation is saying here. We have D is equal to AM plus BN. So there's a typo on the slide, it should be a BN. Now, the definition of an integer being invertible modular N is that it's co-prime to N. So M is invertible modular N only if and only if the GCD is 1. So if I look at this number, if the D is 1, and if I look at this equation, 1 is equal to AM plus BN, then I'm getting, if I compute this mod N, well, the BN disappears because N is 0, and I'm left with A, uh, 1 is congruent to A times M modular N. Or rearranging the order, I get that the inverse of m modulo n is a. So in our case, well, we had a GCD which was 3. So the 213 is not invertible modulo 312, or the other way around. Um, so here we don't get an inverse. You know, but if you have that the GCD is 1, then you can invert. And only then you can invert. Anyway, that's it for this lecture. Thanks for your attention.